Welcome to U of L today with Mark Hebert on 1080 WKJK. For the first time, we are now on iHeartMedia here in Louisville, Kentucky. This is the show that's about all things University of Louisville, where we talk to researchers, faculty members, staff, students about what's going on at the University of Louisville. So stick around for the next half hour or so. Maybe you'll learn something. Well, on the show today, anxiety is a major problem with older people. Fear of falling, phobias, medication lapses. We'll talk about anxiety in seniors and what can be done about it. Also, what do you know about the fish in the Ohio River? A U of L biology professor will be here to talk about the Ohio and maybe share some fun facts about what or who is in the water. But first, Ted Smith was once the technology and innovation czar for the city of Louisville, but now he's at U the University of Louisville as deputy director of the Christy Lee Brown Envirome Institute, which looks at our environment and how it impacts our health. And he's here to talk about a number of initiatives that are going on with the Envirome Institute. Ted, good to see you. It's good to be here again. And welcome, uh, welcome back. Yeah. Uh, so, what was your job with the city of Louisville at one point? So, I was uh, the city's first chief innovation officer. So, uh, Mayor Fisher, when he was elected to his first term, wanted to do things a little differently. And so, he wanted to make sure that somebody was accountable for what he would think of as breakthrough work. So, you know, we want to pick up the garbage, we want to arrest the criminals, you want to do the stuff that you expect city government to do. But then there are the things that people aren't expecting. And I think that we demonstrated together over many years that there were all sorts of opportunities to learn together as a community about how to be a better place. Okay, so then you come over to the University of Louisville, and now you're the number two guy in the Envirome Institute. What's the Envirome Institute? Explain that to me. So the Envirome Institute, uh, I like to tell people at cocktail parties, if you like the genome, you'll love the Envirome. So <laughs> it's really just the other side of the coin. So we're all very used to thinking like, oh, I wonder what my genetics are and if I'm going to get cancer or whatever. And, and we're very focused inwardly on our health. And the truth of the matter is your environment is a significantly better predictor of your future health status than your genes are. And so we've made a commitment at the University of Louisville to build out this new field, which we call enviromics. But the idea is really let's think about all those factors in the environment and how important they are to your future health and wellness. We're talking with Ted Smith, who's the deputy director of the Christy Lee Brown Enviroment Institute at the University of Louisville. You've got a little talk coming up, uh, the Beer with the Scientist series, what the, uni what the University of Louisville does at the Whole Sopple Brewery uh, here in, what, it's later on in uh, July, right? Uh, well, it happened. It happened. It already <laughs> happened. Okay, so you already made the speech. It did. Absolutely. Right. I'd be happy well, to well, recount the speech. Well, well, that's what I want you to do. <laughs> sure. So how did yeah. that go? You talked about uh, a vision of going to Mars and right. how that uh, might make us look a little more, uh, I don't know, more in depth at what we have here on Earth, right? That's right. So, uh, for the for about the past decade, I've been involved with uh, Johnson Space Center's uh, human performance uh, research team uh, in various capacities. So, when I was working for the mayor, I was actually also flying to Houston and being involved in at that point uh, industry innovation initiatives for space flight. Uh, last year, with the creation of the Avirome Institute, I joined the scientific advisory board of something called the Translation Research Institute for Space Health, which NASA uses as their uh, sort of uh, tip of the spear to solve the hardest problems that get in the way of us doing deep exploration as humans. And so as part of my role in that scientific advisory board, I organized uh, a workshop up at MIT, though the Envirome Institute organized it. We held it at mm -hmm. MIT uh, back in February. And um, we focused the entire agenda of that on these issues that are very difficult for the space program to research. Um, and they include isolation for long periods of time. And so we, we don't really know what four people in a very small space uh, how they will fare over 18 months, which is the trip to Mars and back. Right. And so there's a list of risks that NASA's trying to work through. It's called the red risk Physiological. List. It's, mainly, I mean, right? it's, well, it's, uh, well, and psychological too. Psychological, so, yeah. so depression and aggression and ability to work with others are seen as mission stopping risks. So unless we can get an understanding of how to get ahead of depression, how to get ahead of aggression and how to create a continuously cooperative environment, we can't go. I mean, b because we know that in the limited times on Earth when this has happened, polar expeditions, submarines that are stranded, um, you know, bad things have happened. And so we know that humans don't deal with this kind of isolation where there's not a safety button mm -hmm. and they can just come out, right? right? So we are, we're very focused on what we can put inside that spacecraft that kind of supports life, right? So what are the things that when you, when you diminish the world, uh, create these health risks. Uh, so anyway, so we dedicated the whole thing to, is it smells, is it sights, is it right. plants, is it animal? I mean, 
a and, Noah's Ark kind of a conversation. But as you, you mentioned to me in an email, the, the, the key here is how that fits into what we have on Earth right now and how protective we ought to be on, exactly. on what we have here because so, Mars, Mars is a crapshoot. Right. It's, it's a classic. You don't know what you have until it's gone, right? right. So, so now that we look at how little uh, you know, we'll have to, to work with on this exploration, uh, we really have to be very judicious. I mean, what are the most important things to keeping people well? And it's really forcing us to think about things that we just assumed, you know, that we knew. And, you know, I, we don't know if we can live without the biome of plants and animals. We just, we don't know. And so we need to understand that right now. And so what is the Envirome Institute doing in those spaces then to try and figure out how the environment impacts sure. health? on earth <laughs> so, so um, we have an ambitious project that many people in our community know about called the green heart project and the green heart project for us is um is, is a really pioneering effort to uh, try to establish why living near green spaces reduces cardiovascular risk there's a lot of people that just know there's correlational studies like hey, it's better if you're living near green but um this will be the first project in the united states to focus on finding these mechanisms. And if we can find these mechanisms, it, it directly prescribes at some point the kind of circumstances that we need to put these crew members into. So we're looking for the dose response curve where the drug is nature. And it's a very ambitious, first of its kind kind of project. And we're the sort of perfect people to do it because we're so committed to understanding these environmental factors from a human health perspective. Talking with Ted Smith, the deputy director of the Envirome Institute at the University of Louisville. And part of that is planting a bunch of trees in, in a neighborhood or a couple of neighborhoods in Louisville, right? To That's figure right. out how That's it right. might impact the health of those folks in those neighborhoods. That's right. So and explain that. Yeah, so, so um, it's a controlled trial, you know, meaning we're uh, going into four neighborhoods in South Louisville, and um, some of those are areas that we will uh, give the drug, plant trees and bushes, and some of those are areas where we won't for a period of time. And uh, so we'll have matched uh, groups, and in the next two years, we'll be planting about 10,000 trees and shrubs, um, increasing the greenness by about 10%. Uh, and there's a plenty of literature that suggests this kind of increasing of greenness has been associated with um, uh, reduced mortality, lower cardiovascular disease risk. And so we'll be looking at those people over five years uh, to see if their risks um, have improved. And these are primarily uh, neighborhoods in South Louisville, as yep. I recall. Yep. So if you think about sort of the area between the airport and Churchill Downs, you know, kind of in that area. Uh, so we have the Waterson Expressway as a, as a well-known um, sort of source of air pollution in the area. And we'll be working hard to sort of mitigate some of the effects of the, of the interstate. So the idea of this experiment is you plant a bunch of bushes and trees in, in one neighborhood in one space. And the idea uh, apparently is that the trees will essentially suck up the pollution that would normally That's be right. in, in your lungs and in your body? That's right. So, so you know, when we went to NIH, my colleague, Rooney Botnagar, mm -hmm. who's the principal investigator, uh, you know, we had to have a core theory, right, a hypothesis that w what greenery does to improve lifespan is it improves perhaps the air quality. And so the core hypothesis is that, you know, we believe that greenery will remove air pollution. We're measuring air pollution right now in those neighborhoods. We'll measure air pollution for five years. Um, so we hope to see if that is the effect of greenery, then we'll see those reductions in air pollution. That's not to say that we won't see improvements in health from other mm -hmm. other associations it's just our primary task is to figure out whether this is the route a couple other things we've only got a couple minutes left but a couple other things i want to throw at you here you've got a, a couple other projects that fall into the environments to do one is uh, the uh, the investigation of e-cigarettes and what yep. impact they have on health another is uh, obesity and di diabetes yep. and what impact how what is impacting that so talk about those real quick well, so for us, maybe the simplest way for people to keep track of what we do at the Envirome Institute is our core expertise is cardiovascular health. And so that we are good at uh, assessing cardiovascular risk. And so we look at the vasculature, think of it as the canary in the coal mine. So if there's ever any kind of stress on the system, on your biology, you will see it first often in the vasculature. And so e-cigarettes and vaping are obviously a stressor on the system, and we see uh, how that um, increases the likelihood of a cardiovascular event. Uh, we see in, um, in, the, in the greenery work, you know, we see this relationship with cardiovascular health. So um, in all of our sort of major um, activities, we're focused on understanding how these environmental factors are 
affecting our future well-being by looking at the vasculature repair mechanisms. Mm -hmm. So the bottom line is that this groundbreaking work is being done at the University of Louisville and the Enviro Institute is the umbrella organization doing it. Is that the bottom line? That's right. I mean, we, and we have big visions for all the, we're into nutrition, um, into social networks. I mean, there, there, are, there are a lot of places you can take this environmental concept. As long as we stay at the home bases, we understand how the cardiovascular system starts to break down. That will always be our indicator of whether we're getting somewhere. All right, Ted Smith, Deputy Director of the Christy Lee Brown Enviro Institute at the University of Louisville. Always great talking to you. Everybody has a little anxiety, but as you get older, it gets sometimes tougher to deal with. Dr. Ray Perry is an Associate Professor of Psychiatry at UofL, and Dr. Steve Lipman is an Emeritus Professor and the Director of the UofL Observership Program, and they're here to talk about older folks and sometimes how anxiety know, can sometimes get them down, right? Ray, welcome to the program. Okay, glad you're well, here. Steve, glad you're here. Thank you. Welcome, Good welcome to back. be here. Thank you for having us. Yeah, sure, thank sure. you for uh, having me, yes. Okay. All right. And uh, I will start out with uh, separating, separating out anxiety and fear. Yeah, what's the difference? What's the difference between anxiety and fear? Well, fear is a reaction to an imminent danger. The threat is immediate, and it usually is associated with an autonomic uh, arousal in the person, and there is a usual fight or flight mechanism. The individual wants to escape. Or so fear is, fear is immediate. Fear, fear is something that's happening right now. Somebody walks in that room with a gun, in our room with a gun. That's fear. That's, that's fear. fear. All right, that's, that's right. not anxiety. So what's anxiety? Anxiety is concern about future danger, something that will happen uh, possibly in the future possible imminent threats. It's usually an overestimation of the danger of this imminent threat. And the individual uh, has, with an anxiety disorder, will have a persistent overestimation of the uh, possible dangers. So. Right. So, and, and you've studied this in what it's like to have anxiety in older people. Is it do older people have a tougher time with anxiety than, you know, folks? Oh, I'm really young. So, <laughs> so folks that are younger, is that a big deal in older folks? Well, actually, older people have a lesser occurrence of anxiety disorders. Okay. They're, uh, generally, they have some very specific anxiety concerns that are not uh, present in younger individuals. And as an example, a fear of falling is a very common concern in a lot of older individuals, especially if they've had previous falls, and especially if they have to use um, walkers or any kind of gait assistance devices. So uh, what happens when they have this fear of falling is they usually limit their walking, and they reduce their walking. Actually, it's a fear of a situation of walking without falling. So they don't want to put themselves in that situation of the potential for falling. That's a big anxiety among older they folks. They limit their walking. Yeah, gotcha. And this in turn limits their um, going out and um, out of the house. It limits their socialization. It limits their volunteering for uh, help in situations. So it really reduces uh, their activities just quite a bit. Talk with Dr. Ray Perry, who's an associate professor of psychiatry at UofL, and also Dr. Steve Lipman, who's a psychiatrist by trade and an emeritus professor at the University of Louisville. Well, Steve, what are some of the other things that perhaps older folks might have anxiety about that we wouldn't, uh, or that, well, <laughs> I'm saying we're not old. That's what I'm, that's well, what I'm doing The people here. that have survived <laughs> to old age or already have gotten over some of the problems that the younger ones have maybe succumbed to or well, become money, marriage, those kinds of things that or become alcoholics or become yeah. drug abusers and then died early. So it's it's kind of a natural selection that older people are, are, are different in that regard. One thing that to amplify another point of Ray, when you restrict your activity, that means you're gonna restrict your muscles, your heart activity and all the and, and your brain activity and all those things have a kind of the negative uh, cycle of vicious cycle downward and you know they use that old expression uh, use it or you lose it mm -hmm. so if you're not walking you're gonna walk less well if you walk less well and you restrict yourself further you're gonna walk further worse you're right and, and that, that so it is, compounds itself it's kind of a domino effect yes and that I think Ray's mentioning that is very interesting because that is a specific 
fear of older people that doesn't exist right. really much in younger people because right. they don't have that problem. Right. What's phobia? What's the difference between phobia and anxiety and fear? Uh, a phobia is a uh, anxiety of a specific object or specific situation, and the and the anxiety is exaggerated, uh, and it usually happens almost every time that the individual is confronted with this feared object or situation. Examples would be uh, a fear of insects, fear of blood, fear of open spaces. Snakes. Snakes, <laughs> etc. cetera. Height. Height, uh, something heights. like that, fear of height. That's a phobia. Or speaking, public speaking. Okay. Yes. So all those things are phobias. Yes. So do older folks have a uh, greater chance to have a phobia than younger folks? Or does that, is that... Uh, is it not spread across the ages that way? The uh, general occurrence of phobias is reduced uh, over the age. For example, it's about a 10% occurrence of phobias um, in people age 70, and that drops down to about a 4% uh, experience of phobias at people that are age 79. So mm -hmm. there is a gradual drop. However, uh, the, uh, as I said previously, the fear of falling or the fear of walking without falling is uh, a very common phobia in older So that's considered people. a phobia as yeah. well. All right, well, how do you treat older folks if, if they've got this bad anxiety or they've got a phobia? I mean, do you treat them with drugs? Is there some, uh, you know, can you send them to Steve Lipman over here and tell well, them uh, you just need, they need some psychiatric help? What happens? Well, one form of treatment uh, would be a cognitive behavioral therapy in which people are uh, exposed to the feared situation if possible. They can be either exposed uh, and confront the feared object directly, or they can be exposed uh, mentally uh, uh, in their mind to the feared situation. So exposure over time uh, and confrontation of uh, the practice of avoidance, in other words, counteracting the avoidance, which occurs with uh, the feared situation, is one mechanism to uh, uh, counteract phobias. People uh, generally overestimate uh, the uh, negative consequences uh, of confronting a feared object, and they underestimate uh, a lot of positive Right. values. Right. But that's a form of psychotherapy. That's a right. talk therapy. It's yes. not pharmaceutical. Right. And related to that too, a lot of times people can be helped by physical methods like Tai Chi, yoga, or just simple exercise, or these group exercises that you see in, on the TV and on uh, at, at um, exercise centers where everybody's doing the same thing right, right. together. We've only got a couple minutes left. I'm with Dr. Ray Perry and, and St Dr. Steve Lippman, both from the University of Louisville, and we're talking about phobias and anxiety in older folks. So, but getting, you talked about it, Steve, for a minute, drugs. Um, are there drugs out there that are prescribed to help these folks deal with their anxiety? And is there a risk of giving drugs to a person who is 85 years old? Yes. Well, the biggest yes. risk is, oh, go ahead. Okay. Yes, there are drugs for phobias, and uh, typically, uh, if you use a benzodiazepine in a, a short acting and for a very limited amount of time, this can uh, help with the phobia. What would, but, what would be the name brand of that drug? Uh, I don't know what that some is. Some examples of benzodiazepines are Valium okay. or uh, lorazepam or Ativan. So those are common, those common, are, those common are drugs that a lot of people take. Drugs. And yeah. to make it easy to understand, that those are sometimes you say people fear of flying. They can take an Ativan before they fly, only then, and that's it. Right, but but yeah. can you? But do you prescribe these for no. long or short periods no. of time? What happens when you prescribe them over a longer period of time is that they promote dependency uh, and they have a liability for falls and fractures. The benzodiazepines especially are very dangerous in terms of promoting falls and fractures and increasing memory problems in the 
uh, older individuals. They already have memory problems right. with, with their age. So, Dr. Lippman, the bottom line here is don't prescribe these drugs for long periods of time for older folks, right? I well, think, limit, limit. I mean, they have to be carefully controlled. There are people that take benzos for decades and don't have any problem. The other main group uh, that Dr. Perry would, would be recommending is this, the SSRIs like uh, Prozac and those kind of drugs. And, and related ones, the NSRIs, those guys are usually the first pharmacotherapy, the first pharmaceutical way of treating anxiety. There are some other minor groups, but those are the two major. Right, right. right. Okay. The, uh, the SSRI drugs are more, uh, uh, they have a longer duration of action, and they usually have a delayed onset of action. So the, the benzos work right right away and the anti uh the ssri drugs uh take longer to have right. a preventative right. effect all right all right dr ray perry appreciate you being on the show steve lipman always good to see you what's going on underneath the surface of the ohio river well as part of louisville's series of lectures about the ohio river uofl associate dean of arts and sciences and biology professor linda fusile will be talking about the fish in the ohio on july 16th at a little program over in southern indiana so i thought i'd have her on the program and talk a little bit about what she's going to say linda welcome thank to the show you. thank you for having me here it's really an honor to be <laughs> Uh, asked to speak with you. Uh, and, I don't know about an honor, but uh, <laughs> we're glad you're here. <laughs> um, so fish in the Ohio, it's an interesting interesting topic. It caught my eye, and that's why I uh, emailed you and gave you a call. What are you going to say about the fish in the Ohio? Mm -hmm. Just kind of start at a, at a broad level. What, mm -hmm. what should we know that perhaps people don't already know about fish in the Ohio River? Yeah, so one thing is that the group of fishes in the Ohio River are particularly special. The Ohio River is the fourth largest river in the, actually in North America. Mm -hmm. So we have what are called large river fishes, things like um, the paddlefish and the sturgeon that you just don't find in smaller rivers. But what's really interesting about the Ohio River, and especially because we're right by the falls of the Ohio, is that we have an incredible historic record of the fishes that were in the Ohio River going all the way back to the beginning of the 1800s. So there have been many people, in fact, they really laid the groundwork for ichthyology in North America by working at the Falls of the Ohio, talking to fishermen, talking to commercial fishermen and things like that to find out what was in the river and actually started describing new species out of the river back in 1818 with Raffinesque and even before that with Lesur. So has there been a big change from the 1800s to here we are in 2019? Has there been a gigantic change in the kinds of fish and, and what we would find and what fishermen or fisherwomen would find in the Ohio right. River? Uh, you know, in fact, some people would say that it has changed a lot. And one of my points to talk, uh, you know, about talking about the fish in Ohio River in particular is that often that baseline of change comes from the 1950s when um, the, there, there started surveys in the locks and dams and wrote known surveys and things like that in the mid 50s. And people have been going back to those surveys and looking at fish that were, that were appearing in those surveys and basically saying, well, you know, now in the 80s and 90s and the 2000s, we've really come a long way, right? So we're actually seeing increases in range of fishes that were before you wouldn't find, for example, in the upper main stem of the Ohio. When you talk the upper, up near Pittsburgh, or what are we talking yeah, about? Yeah, okay. yeah. So Louisville would be in the middle section of the river, kind of at the sort of almost to the lower section of the river, kind of right on that border. So upper, yeah, up by um, Pittsburgh and West Virginia and so forth. And so the range extensions are good because those fish used to be throughout the main stem of the Ohio, and now they're expanding expanding again. The interesting thing, though, is that is just from the viewpoint of really from the 50s until now. And the 50s was about the peak of the pollution, really, in the Ohio River. When you start looking at the historic records, using the 50s as a baseline is not a very good idea, right? Because the historic records show that the fish were super abundant in the early 1800s. In fact, people were already noting before 1900 the disappearance of fishes, right? Like the sturgeon in particular that was over harvested for sturgeon eggs for roe. So there have been changes. Fishes were super abundant 
and the species that we found to find today might not be very different from the species that we were that you were finding, you know, even almost a hundred years ago. But the abundance is definitely different. Right, the number of the fish. Yes, right. and also we. Have, but it's going back up, right? I assume it is going back 50s. up compared to the fifties. Right. Yeah, but, but not compared to well. But but is there any river in America that has more fish in it than it did in the eighteen hundreds when there? Probably not. Yeah. But the important part of that is is that when people work on conservation of fresh waters, right, they often set targets for their fish populations, and what happens is they'll set targets based on things like in the fish. 50s, right? Mm -hmm. So a target for the 50s is not necessarily the best place in terms of conservation. Pretty low bar. Is what pretty, low pretty, bar pretty low bar, exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right. Again, we're talking with Linda Fusile. She is a biology professor at the University of Louisville and the Associate Dean of Arts and Sciences. She's going to be giving a talk about the fish of the Ohio River on July 16th over in southern Indiana. Where is that talk, by the way? That is at the Carnegie Museum okay. in, in New Albany. New Albany? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about then what's going on right now. Um, what What are the kinds of fish that we have in the Ohio River? I, I, you know, you see bass fishermen out there. Yeah. Those kinds of things. What are the fish that are the, mm -hmm. the usual suspects in the Ohio River these days? Yeah. Well, one of my favorites, of course, is the paddlefish, which you can't beat the paddlefish. It's like a prehistoric animal. It basically is a plankton feeder. It has a huge mouth, so it swims with its mouth open like you might think of as a shark. In fact, it was when it was first identified, people thought it was a freshwater shark because it is, has a cartilaginous skeleton. But it also has this very long nose, a rostrum that has electroreceptors on it so that it can find its prey. Mm -hmm. It is a large river fish. Now, and paddlefish eggs are like caviar, right? They're like exactly. freshwater caviar, because I've seen those in restaurants and in uh, mm -hmm. places around Louisville before. So these yes. are being harvested then, right? Yeah, actually they are being harvested. You have to have a commercial license to harvest them. And there have been many restrictions placed on the harvests of paddlefish, especially mm -hmm. recently. But it was the sturgeon that were originally harvested for the row. Right. And the lake sturgeon, which actually used to be found in Ohio River, are completely gone from the Ohio River. We still have a little sturgeon called a shovel nose sturgeon, though, which okay. is just as cool. And But the, the, the usual suspects, I mean, you're, you're talking, uh, you know, what, largemouth bass, yeah. any trout? Any uh, trout? Uh, actually, any of the trout that you would find in the Ohio Probably River not. have been introduced. Yeah. 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 And, and what about the carp? I mean, you, you got some of these invasive species of carp that folks talk about all the time uh, in some of the lakes down in western Kentucky. Are yes. they invading the Ohio River? They are, unfortunately, invading the Ohio River. The common carp has been here since the 1800s, about 1870. But the newly introduced, relatively newly introduced Asian carp, there are a few different species, have been just invading freshwater areas throughout the throughout the United States and and they have a very uh, I don't know they have a, a negative impact through many different ways but one is that often they're eating the phytoplankton or sorry the zooplankton that other fish like the paddlefish would want to eat and so taking actually, food away from the other fish yes and they're changing the whole trophic structure of the river so it's quite a danger and they do seem to be not only spreading but also becoming established all right Linda Fusilla, thank you professor at the University of Louisville. thanks for being on the show thanks for listening to you about today with Mark Hebert and go cards <laughs> <laughs>